Chapter Eight of A Slave Is a Slave by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight. The nuclear works on Estragonia were closed down. Mikhail Escafar ordered a program of rationing and priorities to conserve the stock of plutonium and radioactive isotopes on hand, and he decided that henceforth nuclear energy materials would be sold instead of furnished freely. He simply found out what the market quotations on Odin were, translated that into stellies, and adopted it. This was just a base price. There would have to be bribes for priority allocations, rake-offs for the under-freedmen, and graft for the business freedmen of the Lord's ex-masters who bought the stuff. The latter were completely unconcerned. None of them even knew about it. The convocation adjourned until the next regular session, and the mid-year feasts, an eight-day intercalary period which permitted dividing the 358-day Adityan year into ten months of thirty-five days each. Count Erskyll was satisfied to see them go. He was working on a constitution for the commonwealth of Aditya, and was making very little progress with it. "'It's one of those elaborate check-and-balance things,' Lons Degbrin reported. To begin with, it was the constitution of Aton, with an elective president substituted for a hereditary king. Of course there are a lot of added gadgets, Atonian radical democrat stuff. Chimid and Hotshet and the other chief slaves don't like it either. Slap your mouth and say freedmen five times. Nuts, his subordinate retorted insubordinately. I know a slave when I see one. A slave is a slave, with or without a georget. If he doesn't wear it around his neck, he has it tattooed on his soul. It takes at least three generations to rub it off. I could wish that Count Erskyll, he began. What else is our proconsul doing? Well, I'm afraid he's trying to set up some kind of a scheme for the complete nationalization of all farms, factories, transport facilities, and other means of production and distribution, Dugbrin said. He's not going to try to do that himself, is he? He was, he discovered, speaking sharply, and modified his tone. He won't do it with imperial authority, or with imperial troops, not as long as I'm here. And when we go back to Odin, I'll see to it that von Sutrak understands that. Oh, no, the Commonwealth of Aditya will do that, Degbrin said. Chimid and Hauset and Yakub Zanar and Zorich Kahuzik and the rest of them, that is. He wants it done legitimately and legally. That means he'll have to wait till the mid-year feasts, when the convocation assembles, and he can get his constitution enacted, if he can get it written by then. Van Shatrak sent two of the destroyers off to explore the moons of Aditya, of which there were two. The outer moon, Aditya Ba, was an irregular chunk of rock fifty miles in diameter, barely visible to the naked eye. The inner, Aditya Aleph, however, was an eight hundred mile sphere. It had once been the planetary ship station and shipyard base. It seemed to have been abandoned when the Adityan technology and economy had begun sagging under the weight of the slave system. Most of the installations remained, badly run down, but repairable. Shatrak transferred as many of his technicians as he could spare to the Mizar, and sent her to recondition the shipyard and render the underground city inhabitable again, so that the satellite could be used as a base for his ships. He decided then to send the Irma back to Odin, with reports of annexation of Aditya, a proposal that Aditya Aleph be made a permanent imperial navy base, and the requests for more troops. Prince Trevanion taped up his own reports, describing the general situation on the newly annexed planet, and doing nothing to minimize the problems facing its proconsul. Count Erskyll, he finished, is doing the best possible under circumstances from which I myself would feel inclined to shrink. If not carried to excess, perhaps youthful idealism is not without value in Empire statecraft. I understand that Commodore Shetrak, who is also coping with some very trying problems, is requesting troop reinforcements. I believe this request amply justified, and would recommend that they be gotten here as speedily as possible. 
I understand that he is also recommending a permanent naval base on the larger of this planet's two satellites. This I also endorse unreservedly. It would have a most salutary effect on the local government. I would further recommend that Commodore Shatrak be placed in command of it, with suitable promotion which he has long ago earned. Erskyll was surprised that he was not himself returning to Odin on the destroyer, and evidently disturbed. He mentioned it during pre-dinner cocktails that evening. "'I know my own work here is finished,' was the moment the convocation voted acknowledgment of imperial rule, Prince Trevanion replied. I would like to stay on for the mid-year feasts, though. The convocation will vote on your constitution, and I would like to be able to report their action to the Prime Minister. How is it progressing, by the way?" "'Well, we have a rough draft. I don't care much for it myself. But Citizen Huzhet and Citizen Chimid and Citizen Zanar and the others are most enthusiastic, and, after all, they are the ones who will have to operate under it. The masterly estates would be the representative units. From each the freedmen would elect representatives to regional elective councils, and these in turn would elect representatives to a central electoral council, which would select a supreme people's legislative council. This would not only function as the legislative body, but would also elect a manager-in-chief, who would appoint the chiefs of management, who in turn would appoint their own subordinates. I don't like it myself," Erskyll said. It's not democratic enough. There should be a direct vote by the people. Well, he grudged, I suppose it will take a little time for them to learn democracy. This was the first time he had come out and admitted that. There is to be a constitutional convention in five years to draw up a new constitution. How about the convocation? You don't expect them to vote themselves out of existence, do you? Oh, we're keeping the convocation in the present constitution, but they won't have any power. Five years from now we'll be rid of them entirely. Uh, look here, you're not going to work against this, are you? You won't advise these side-demon lords master to vote against it when it comes up? Certainly not. I think your constitution, Gregor Chimids and Chachal Hoshets, to be exact, will be nothing short of political disaster, but it will ensure some political stability which is all that matters from the imperial point of view. An empire statesman must always guard against sympathizing with local factions and interests, and I can think of no planet on which I could be safer from any such temptation. If these lords master want to vote their throats cut, and the slaves want to re-enslave themselves, they may all do so with my complete blessing." If he had been given at all to dramatic gestures, he would then have sent for water and washed his hands. Metaphorically, he did so at that moment. Thereafter his interest in Adityan affairs was that of a spectator at a boring and stupid show, watching only because there was nothing else to watch, and wishing that it had been possible to have returned to Odin on the Irma. The Prime Minister, however, was entitled to a full and impartial report, which he would scarcely get from Count Erskyll on this new jewel in the imperial crown. To be able to furnish that he would have to remain until the mid-year feasts, when the convocation would act on the new constitution. Whether the constitution was adopted or rejected was, in itself, unimportant. In either case Aditya would have a government recognizable as such by the empire, which was already recognizing some fairly unlikely-looking governments. In either case, too, Aditya would make nobody on any other planet any trouble. It wouldn't have, at least for a long time, even if it had been left unannexed. But no planet inhabited by Terro humans could be trusted to remain permanently peaceful and isolated. There is a spark of aggressive ambition in every Terro human people, no matter how debased, which may smolder for centuries or even millennia and then bursts, fanned by some random wind, into flame. To shift the metaphor slightly, the Empire could afford to leave no unwatched pots around to boil over unexpectedly. Occasionally he did warn young Erskyll of the dangers of overwork and emotional over-involvement. Each time the proconsul would pour out some tale of bickering and rivalry among the chief freedmen of the managements. 
Citizen Kahuzik and Citizen Escobar, they were all calling each other citizen now, were contesting overlapping jurisdictions. Kahuzik wanted to change the name of his management, he no longer bothered mentioning Cesar Martwin, to Labor and Industry. To this Michael Escobar objected vehemently. Any industry that was going to be managed would be managed by his. R.A.'s Bortsal was similarly left unmentioned. Management of public works. And they were also feuding about the robotic and remote-controlled equipment that had been sent down from the Empress Eulalie to the Astragonia Nuclear Power Works. Kahuzik was also in controversy with Yakup Zanar, who was already calling himself People's Provost Marshal. Kahuzik had taken over all the privately armed guards on the masterly farms and in the factories, and assimilated them into something he was calling the People's Labor Police, ostensibly to enforce the new code of employment practice. Zanar insisted that they should be under his management. When Chimid and Hoshet supported Kahuzik, he began clamoring for the return of the regular army to his control. Commodore Shatrak was more than glad to get rid of the Adityan army, and so was Pierre Ravney, who was in immediate command of them. The Adityans didn't care one way or the other. Zanar was delighted, and so were Chimid and Hoshet. So oddly was Sahor Kahuzik. At the same time the state of martial law, proclaimed on the day of landing, was terminated. The days slipped by. There were entertainments at the new proconsular palace by the masterly residents of Zegensburg, and Erskel and his staff were entertained at masterly palaces. The latter affairs pained Prince Trevanion excessively. Hours on end of gorging, uninspired cooking, and guzzling too sweet wine, and watching ex-slave performers whose acts were either brutal or obscene, and frequently both, and more unforgivably stupidly so. The masterly conversation was simply stupid. He borrowed a recon car from Ravney, he and Lons Degbrin, and usually one or another of Ravney's young officers, took long trips of exploration. They fished in mountain streams, and hunted the small deer-like game, and he found himself enjoying these excursions more than anything he had done in recent years, certainly anything since Aditya had come into the view-screens of the Empress Eulalie. Once in a while they claimed and received masterly hospitality at some large farming estate. They were always greeted with fulsome cordiality and there was always surprise that persons of their rank and consequence should travel unaccompanied by a retinue of servants. He found things the same wherever he stopped. None of the farms were producing more than a quarter of the potential yield per acre, and all depleting the soil outrageously. Ten slaves—he didn't bother to think of them as freedmen—during the work of one and a hundred of them taking all day to do what one robot would have done before noon. White-gowned chief slaves lording it over green and orange-gowned supervisors and clerks. Overseers still carrying and frequently using whips and knouts and sandbag flails. Once or twice, when a masterly back was turned, he caught a look of murderous hatred flickering into the eyes of some upper slave. Once or twice, when a master thought his was turned, he caught the same look in masterly eyes, directed at him or at Lons. The mid-year feasts approached. Each time he returned to the city he found more excitement as preparations went on. Michael Eschkafar's management of public works was giving top priority to redecorating the convocation chamber, and the lounges and dining-rooms around it in which the masters would relax during recesses. More and more masterly families flocked in from outlying estates, with contragravity flotillas and retinues of attendants, to be entertained at the city palaces. There were more and gaudier banquets and balls and entertainments. By the time the feasts began, every masterly man, woman, and child would be in the city. There were long columns of military contragravity coming in, too, troop carriers and combat vehicles. Yakub Zanar was bringing in all his newly recovered army, and Zahor Kahusik, his newly organized People's Labor Police. 
Van Shatrak, who was now commanding his battle-line unit by screen from the proconsular palace, began fretting. "'I wish I hadn't been in such a hurry to terminate martial rule,' he said once. "'And I wish Pierre hadn't been so confoundedly efficient in retraining those troops. That may cost us a few extra casualties before we're through.' Count Erskyll laughed at his worries. "'It's just this rivalry between Citizen Kahuzik and Citizen Zanar,' he said. "'They're like a couple of side-demon lords, master, competing to give more extravagant feasts. Zanar's going to hold a review of his troops, and, of course, Kahuzik intends to hold a review of his police. That's all there is to it.' "'Well, just the same, I wish some reinforcements would get here from Odin,' Shatrak said. Erskyll was busy in the days before the mid-year feasts either conferring at the citadel with the ex-slaves who were the functional heads of the managements, or at the proconsular palace with Hoshet and Chimid and the chief freedmen of the influential convocation leaders and presidium members. Everyone was extremely optimistic about the Constitution. He couldn't quite understand the optimism himself. "'If I were the Lord's Master, I wouldn't even consider the thing,' he told Erskyll. "'I know they're stupid.' But I can't believe they're stupid enough to commit suicide. And that's what this amounts to." "'Yes, it does,' Erskyll agreed cheerfully. "'As soon as they enact it, they'll be of no more consequence than the assemblage of peers on Aton. They'll have no voice in the operation of the Commonwealth, and none in the new constitution that will be drawn up five years from now. And that will be the end of them. All the big estates and the factories and mines and contragravity ship lines will be nationalized. And they'll have nothing at all, except a hamper full of repudiated paper stellies, he finished. That's what I mean. What makes you think they'll be willing to vote for that? They don't know they're voting for it. They think they're voting to keep control of the mastership. People like Olvir Nicolon and Rovar Javasan and Rondal Valdry and Cesar Martwin think they still own their chief freedmen. They think Hoshet and Shemid and Zanar and Kahuzik will do exactly what they tell them. And they believe anything the Hoshets and Shemids and Zanars tell them. And every chief freedman is telling his lord employer that the only way they can keep control is by adopting the Constitution, that they can control the elections on their estates and hand-pick the People's Legislative Council. I tell you, Prince Trevanion, the Constitution is as good as enacted. End of section 8